Hi, and welcome to everyone for joining us on Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Nagesh Kaunika. I'm a specialist practicing fertility medicine, obstetrics, and gynecology in Mackay at NG Gyne Health. Uh, we have our rooms at uh, the Mata Medical Center. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a very um, very uh, emotive subject of miscarriage. The, the title of the topic is Miscarriage, the Unspoken Loss. I'm affiliated with the organization. I'm going to share my screen now and just see whether we can get you. So today we're going to talk about uh, the topic of miscarriage. Let's get the first slide, yes. Yeah, I'm a fellow of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. I'm affiliated with the organization that you see on your screen. I also have additional qualification in ultrasound and have particular interest in this area. The reason for giving you this background is that in this world where lines are blurred between opinion and evidence base, between belief and science, it is important that we know who is talking to us and the credibility of the content that is being delivered. This Facebook Live is going to be a sincere effort to represent science as it sits on this topic today. I will try my best to put forward the facts uh, to you all smart viewers to draw your own conclusions. If you have any questions, feel free to type in your questions. And if I know the answer, I will give it to you. If I, if I don't, well, I'll make something up. Well, sorry, just kidding. So let's talk about what we uh, talk, talk about miscarriage. The big aspect of miscarriage that often goes missing is the psychological impact that it has on women and couples. And I've decided that I will focus on the woman's or the couple's perspective on this issue. If you have followed Facebook, there is a trailer called Mum, which is misunderstanding in understanding miscarriage you clearly understand that there is a disconnect between society's perception and the women's experience in recognizing miscarriage as a genuine bereavement. I am going to focus on this very significant and real psychological impact that miscarriage has before we talk about the clinical aspect of causes, treatment options, risk factor, and then we will touch upon recurrent miscarriage, tests and therapies, and the current research on this subject. So what is a miscarriage? A woman miscarries when she experiences spontaneous loss of a pregnancy before the 20th week. The symptoms of miscarriage include bleeding, cramping, low back pain, and the release of fluid or tissue. However, not all instances of bleeding are indicative of a miscarriage, and some women who miscarry don't experience any noticeable symptoms. Not always do miscarriages require active treatment, but sometimes a procedure or a medication may be necessary if the pregnancy tissue remains in the body. The elephant in the room in this discourse on miscarriage, or rather the lack of it, is the psychological impact that is often underrated. Pregnancy loss can evoke a range of powerful emotions and couples often feel the loss deeply. I'm going to narrate the impactful account of Alicia Del Prado in her own words. I guess some of you might relate to her story. She's herself an accomplished psychologist, a PhD, which makes this even more relevant. Today, I self-disclose to my mentee that I've had a miscarriage. Until now, 
No one outside my family knew about my miscarriage. The only physical proof that I miscarried besides my electronic medical record is the rose plant my husband and I planted in our baby's honor. But today, when I asked my pregnant student how she was feeling in her first trimester, she shared that she too had miscarried. I felt the emotion rise inside of me, burning up from my stomach and into my chest. My body was hot and my eyes teary. With trepidation, I deliberated if this was a moment to open up or be personal. Our response with a distance empathy. Over the phone in the seconds I had before the silence became awkward, I questioned myself about what would be helpful and appropriate to say to her. I ultimately decided to take the risk and share that I'd also lost a pregnancy. Why? What was my intention? What did I hope to accomplish? I hoped to provide her comfort and communicate that she was not alone. I wanted to give a voice and one more face to the statistic that for women in their childbearing years, the chances of a miscarriage can range between 10 to 25%. One of my doctors told me that one in four recognized pregnancies end in a miscarriage. While these statistics are communicated, there is a lack of discourse about these numbers outside the doctor's office. Where are the narratives of women who both suffer and survive? Where are the perspectives and advocacy of psychologists who help with other losses in life? Loss and grief of loved ones, loss of a marriage, pets and jobs seem to receive recognition. But this ceases to be the case with pregnancy that end involuntarily and prematurely. And so with my self-disclosure, I wanted to lean into changing the silence around miscarriage through one conversation at a time. I believe the invisibility and lack of open discussion about miscarriage is another way many women can be fairly alone, muted, burdened, and stigmatized with an experience that is not their fault. The silence and fear of sharing was so strong for me that it took five years and two children later for me to be able to say the words to another woman, I also had had a miscarriage. Five years of thinking about it in silence, crying at movies where women lose their babies and exchanging knowing glances with my husband. At times we remember what happened the first time I was pregnant. I'm very blessed with two beautiful sons. I love my three-year-old who wears a superhero cape, his fireman helmet and astronaut gloves all at the same time, tying ropes with conviction around my kitchen cabinets to, to make a rocket ship that will fly him to the moon. I love my 11-month-old baby who sings himself to sleep, munches loudly when he eats solids with his two teeth and is able to tackle his older brother even before he walks. And I love my baby that never formed enough to join us on this earth. Who I remember when I water my rose plant in our backyard and I will always cherish in my heart. It is also bewildering that this lack of social discourse continues to occur when the prevalence of miscarriage is so high. While miscarriage is very common, the discussion around it is typically absent or constricted to hushed conversations. Here are some tips for recovery of a miscarriage. While reactions to a miscarriage may vary, some women and their partners miscarrying can elicit a grief just as powerful as if they had lost a child who was already born. Whatever emotional response, response someone has to a miscarriage should be acknowledged and respected. Common feelings associated with miscarriages include self-blame, guilt, fear, fear about one's physical safety, fear about not being able to have additional children, shame, anger, disbelief, sadness, anxiety, confusion, and even relief. However, any feeling is a normal reaction because there is no one right way to respond to a miscarriage.
Personalizing your ritual to fit your beliefs, values, and culture will likely increase the positive impact it may have for you. Writing and reading a poem, listening to a song, painting a picture, saying a prayer, or planting a flower, examples of rituals. You have strengths. Think about the ways you've gone through difficult things in the past and see if these strengths and positive coping strategies work for this time in your life too. Don't buy in into the myth that talking about your miscarriage will only cause you more pain. Opening up to loved ones and even guiding them as to the response or support you need can help release their loneliness and grief. Pregnancy loss support groups and your clinician are a valuable resource to connect you to a community who best understands the experience. Identifying someone you can trust to open up about your miscarriage or miscarriages can be helpful. Initiating such discussions can often be difficult. Reach out to your clinician taking care of you. Your care does not end with the diagnosis and clinical treatment. We are here to be with you at times traveling in the same boat. Sometimes it can be helpful to let them know even before the conversation begins what you're looking for from them. For example, maybe you just want to, them to listen while you're trying to sort out your feelings. There is no correct timeline as to how long you're allowed to think about your feelings. In fact, a well-intentioned near and dear ones often find themselves at loss of what to say. A miscarriage is not only a difficult time for the woman, but also her partner. They may experience the same sense of loss and grief, but feel they have to appear to be strong for the woman and silence those emotions and channel them into work. Discussing the experience, especially if members of a couple grieve differently, can sustain the relationship through the loss. It is not only the loss of their child, it is also the loss of the dreams, the hopes, the expectations they have had for themselves and their families. And this is critical. And sometimes it gets overshadowed in the clinical quest for causes, for answers. Clinically, the management of miscarriage has three treatment choices that could be offered to women experiencing this unfortunate event expectant that is waiting for nature to take its course can sometimes be hard, not knowing when it will all happen, how long it will take. Surgical or what's commonly called a suction curate or a DNC is apparently quick and easy, but it does have surgical complication that one needs to consider, particularly when repeated surgical evacuations. Uh, are, are needed to, that put women at risk of adhesions, scar tissue, and damage to the lining of the uterus. Medical management involves medication that can achieve complete evacuation in the majority of cases also need to be on offer. Understanding remains the first step to healing and hope. Here are some facts that are reassuring, at the same time frustrating. Human reproduction is an inefficient process. 50 to 60% of conceptions fail. Thankfully, most of them, even before the woman realizes she's pregnant, she sometimes passes it off as a delayed or a heavy period. Most of these failed conceptions happen before five weeks of gestation. 13 to 15% of recognized pregnancies end up with a miscarriage. Most of them, 90% of them, between five and 10 weeks. Fetal demise after 10 weeks is rather uncommon. Well, 50 to 70% of miscarriages are due to chromosomal abnormality, something that goes wrong in the formation of the pregnancy, something that is unavoidable, has nothing to do with, with the parent's chromosome. And this statistic gets worse with increasing maternal age. So as alluded previously, advancing maternal age is clearly a risk factor. As you see from this graphic, if you are in your 40s, the chance of ending up with a miscarriage can be as high as one in two or even higher. The risk of miscarriage is 
higher early on in the pregnancy. And the further you go, it significantly reduces, particularly after 10 weeks and after you have seen a reassuring heartbeat in the baby. This is the basis for the tradition where couples typically dread disclosing the news to near dear ones before the 12 week mark. One of the questions that came up said, when is it safe? So it's a very difficult question to say what is safe, but one would say after 12 weeks, it's rather uncommon to lose a pregnancy. Well, if one miscarriage is one too many, then recurrent pregnancy loss can be absolutely dev devastating. We will concentrate a bit on this entity. It remains one that really knocks the wind out of many a prospective parent. Recurrent pregnancy loss, also referred to as recurrent miscarriage, was historically defined as three consecutive pregnancy losses prior to 20 weeks from the last menstrual period. The best available data suggests that the risk of miscarriage in subsequent pregnancy is close to 30% after two losses, compared to 33% after three amongst patients without a history of a live birth. This strongly suggests a rule for evaluation after just two losses in patients with no prior live birth. An earlier evaluation may be further indicated if fetal cardiac activity was identified prior to the loss. The woman is older than 35 years, or if the couple is having difficulty in conceiving, then this also merits for early evaluation. So a lot of factors, not just the number of miscarriages, need to be taken into account to determine how much and what testing we should inflict on couples with miscarriages. Talking about causes, let's look at it from a pragmatic perspective rather than an exhaustive one. Causes that are common with sporadic miscarriages, not necessarily that of recurrent miscarriage. They're unlikely to recur, most of them being chromosomal abnormalities, as I said before, they occur during the formation of the pregnancy. Infections can happen and and lead to a miscarriage, but they're unlikely that the same infection happens again with the next pregnancy. Causes that are likely to recur and are potentially treatable, these are very important from the perspective of an outcome. Example, this is, a, this is the picture of a normal uterus. It has a cavity that is more or less heart-shaped uh, that you can see on the graphic here. The uterus is formed from two tubes that fuse together. So you, if you follow this line, if you have incomplete fusion, you get what is called septate or biconiate uteruses. So in a case of septate uterus that's more predisposed for miscarriage, this can be treated by resecting the septum. So it is important that we diagnose this. This can be diagnosed by using ultrasound, particularly a 3D ultrasound. And we will talk a little bit about that down the line. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. This is, this is the, remains the most significant and proven treatable cause of recurrent pregnancy loss. Then there are influencing factors or risk factors, and we will have a slide dedicated to that. It makes total sense to address every environmental factor at play. We need to also recognize that a significant proportion of miscarriages remain unexplained. Now, unexplained doesn't mean there is no cause, but just that science is not there yet to identify it. The evidence of the effect of environmental factor is based on data studying women with sporadic rather than recurrent miscarriages. The results are conflicting and biased based on conf confounding factors and difficulty in controlling them. Associations with cigarette smoking and caffeine are dose dependent. The evidence is insufficient to confirm their causation Obesity has been reported to increase the incidence of sporadic as well as recurrent miscarriages in retrospective study. 
No amount of alcohol is known to be safe during pregnancy, and it is also likely to be dose dependent. So coming to what investigations we would uh, suggest in cases of recurrent pregnancy loss, this has to be customized. This has to be individualized to the history of miscarriage. When did you miscarry? How many did you miscarry? What stage of pregnancy, whether there was a heartbeat or not, all these things play into what we would recommend. Parental karyotype, which is evaluation of the chromosomes of the parents is one. Uh, investigation that can identify cer certain causes of a recurrent miscarriage. An X-ray called a hysterosalpingogram or a 3D ultrasound looking for anatomical causes like the uterus that I just showed you. Endocrine, which are hormone-based causes like thyroid, insulin resistance, prolactin level, are uh, other investigations that are merit that have merit in cases of recurrent pregnancy loss. Infection is, a, as we said, is a cause of miscarriage, but not necessarily of recurrent pregnancy loss. Autoimmune conditions, the anticardiolipin antibody levels, lupus anticoagulant, they form the basis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and definitely merits a place on this list. There are other factors like homocysteine and thrombophilias, which are tendencies for clotting. They remain in that box where more research is required to find their legitimate place on this list. I apologize for this busy slide, but I wanted to briefly touch upon potential treatment options for specific conditions. If the cause is genetic, genetic counseling, IVF with embryo biopsy and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis can provide an answer. As far as anatomic conditions like the septate uterus that you saw, a hysteroscopy that we look inside the uterus and divide that septum. If there are fibroids within the cavity, again, removing those fibroids can help. If there are large fibroids, there is some suggestion that Removing those fibroids may help, but this is to be taken with, uh, with uh, a full evaluation of that individual case. In polycystic ovarian syndrome, there is, there is a, a suggestion that metformin that improves insulin sensitivity can, can often, can often, um, it can often be an answer, although there is no robust proof of that as of now. Thyroid disorders, thyroid replacement can help. Progesterone supplementation has had its own success in limited studies. Keeping diabetes under control would make total sense. Infections, if there are antibiotics for underlying endometritis, has been touted as a potential treatment option. As far as antiphospholipid antibody syndrome goes, there is good evidence that low dose aspirin, prophylactic low molecular weight heparin is, is beneficial in improving the chance of a live birth in women that suffer from this syndrome. Other thrombophilias we talked about, they they uh, can be treated with uh, low molecular weight heparin, but their benefit in terms of miscarriage has still not been completely proven with robust studies. We talk about environmental exposures and there is one question, can food cause a miscarriage? There are no specific foods that can cause miscarriage, but a balanced diet and avoiding things uh, that uh, potential have, have uh, uh, increase in, uh, increased levels of mercury. For example, large fish early on in pregnancy would make sense. However, it is very difficult to find data that, uh, that supports this theory with, with a fair degree of confidence. If you have high hyperhomocysteine levels, 
Then um, high dose of folic acid has been recommended as a treatment. And uh, these all remain areas where research is warranted and we should look at uh, watching this space. Now I would take any questions. We've had a few questions coming up. Uh, one of the question was, uh, how can a doctor check for a miscarriage? The, the, the definitive diagnosis of a miscarriage is, to, is by ultrasound. An ultrasound identifies, a, stop sharing this screen, yes. Uh, ultrasound diagnoses a miscarriage by saying that uh, the, if the pregnancy at a certain stage of gestation, we should see a, a fetus and we should see a cardiac activity, which means a heartbeat. And if you cannot see a heartbeat at a stage where the size of the baby is more than seven millimeters, it is, di is diagnostic of a miscarriage. The size of the pregnancy sac at which we see either no uh, sign of a baby or no sign of a fetal, uh, fetal heart again can be a diagnose, diagnostic of a miscarriage. There was another question that, how do I know if I'm having a miscarriage? The most common symptom that brings patients to doctors is a bleeding. So if you come up having bleeding in early pregnancy, you need to see a doctor or a, need to have an ultrasound to figure out whether this is still carrying on as a viable pregnancy, is it a miscarriage, or even some cases it could be an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy outside the uterus that has no future. We have more questions coming up. Uh, how can I prevent a miscarriage? So uh, a majority of miscarriages are due to chromosomal abnormality. They're due to no fault of the parents. So the, the premise of saying, how can I prevent it? It just attributes some degree of blame or fault with the parents. And I think that is, that is uh, to a degree misplaced. It is important to realize that, uh, that um, uh, a lot of this is nature's way of evolution and survival of the fittest. So pregnancies with abnormal chromosome sets will end up with a miscarriage in the overwhelming majority. And this forms the major chunk. We do have other causes as we have already alluded to and particularly in women that have multiple miscarriages or miscarriages after seeing a heartbeat, there, there are investigations that need to be done to look for those causes and uh, appropriately treat them. Any other questions? Let me just check if there are any more questions. I think if there are no more questions, I would uh, say thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for uh, logging into this Facebook Live. I would like to give you a 1-800 number, which is 1-800-111-483. If you have any further questions, we would be happy to connect and, uh, and uh, uh, answer those questions for you. Oh, but you've got more questions coming. Uh, after four failed frozen transfer and two miscarriages in the past year with factor five Leiden syndrome, what path of treatment would you recommend? Uh, in this scenario, in this scenario, uh, uh, I think you will need to take into account what at what stage did you have the miscarriages? Uh, and we would we would uh, consider having if you have factor five laden um, uh, disorder, then we would consider having anticoagulants started early in the pregnancy. What we don't have is robust evidence saying that this will work against miscarriage, but there is merits in starting low molecular weight heparin to prevent clotting in the veins irrespective because pregnancy remains a risk for clotting 
and so it's a, it's a, it's it's merit, it has its merits to start low molecular weight uh, heparin and a small dose of aspirin uh, in this in such cases. But I think uh, to say that every miscarriage that happened was because of that factor five laden syndrome is is probably premature. There's one more question here. Uh, how long does it take to recover from a miscarriage? Uh, should you start trying for a pregnancy as soon as possible? This is a very good question, and this is a question that I get all the time. Uh, there is no evidence to suggest that if you start trying earlier, you have any worse outcomes than if you give it a break. Having said that, I think emotional recovery takes longer than physical recovery. So my advice to patients is to say, once you are ready, your body is ready. Can miscarriages run in families? Uh, there are uh, acquired um, syndromes like thrombophilias that are hereditary. So theoretically, yes, it can run in families. Uh, having said that, you have uh, anecdotal experience of different uh, clinical scenario. I had a patient who had a, a, a septate uterus and um, we, decide, we decided to leave her alone because her mother had exactly the same thing and had seven kids. But this girl went on to miscarry. Subsequently, we divided the septum and she had a successful uh, pregnancy. So it is hard to really say that uh, a, a factor that is contributing to the miscarriage is an absolute causative factor. So we have to take each case's, case on its merit and individualize them and uh, uh, tailor its treatment. I would like to refer you all to the trailer of uh, the mis misunderstandings of miscarriage of mum, which is there on the Facebook page of Queensland Fertility Group. It's a it's a, a rather uh, nice nicely done um, video for women's experience through this rather devastating event, and I think the documentary is coming up soon. There's one more question turning up. I recently had a miscarriage at eight weeks after seeing a strong heartbeat at seven weeks after a bleed. Do you think this requires extra investigation? Uh, the individual, case, individual circumstances will have to be taken into consideration. However, I would say definitely it would merit looking into it if you've not had a successful pregnancy. If you are over 35, that would merit looking into it a little bit earlier than if uh, than otherwise. Low dose of, what is low dose of aspirin? That's the next question. Uh, low dose of aspirin is anything 100 milligrams or less. So the, there have been different studies they've used anything between 50 and 100 milligrams, but that's sort of the standard, 100 milligrams of aspirin per day, a single dose is, is considered a low dose. Any other questions? All right. If there are oh, there's something more, no further questions. Okay. So if there are no more questions, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for contributing to those questions. Uh, and as I said, feel free to um, be be in touch with through the one eight hundred number or on the Facebook page, we'll be happy to communicate back. Thank you, thank you and have a good evening.